Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are going to review a couple of things about uh, fuse filament fabrication, and in particular, as the industry moves from form to function, and in, on this show we have the evidence that this is about to happen. So I'm, I'm pretty grateful uh, about being here and seeing all the nice uh, exhibits of all, and all the booths, uh, which is really uh, astonishing here in Birmingham. A few things, a few words about myself. As you can hear, uh, I'm not a native English-speaking person, but I do my best so that you understand me well. Um, in my career, 28 or 9 years at DuPont, I've been working mainly on polymers and application development in all sorts of industries and functions. So basically, I've been working on the, in the other hall, I mean in the industry which is shown on the other hall. So I moved into this hall basically since uh, one or two years so, and I experienced the world of additive manufacturing. And what is nice, it's not only that the people are younger, more creative, but they're also more handsome in this side of the hall. Huh? So that's uh, really nice here. Um, the whole thing is lifting. Okay, let's put that on the side. So well, let's go through the topic that we, we will have to cover. And there is also sort of a small premiere for the EMEA reg region as we are introducing new products onto the market. And as you see, additive manufacturing needs materials. Without the materials, uh, that's not going to be feasible. And uh, don't expect from a chemical company like ours that we are showing the nicest parts. I think the nicest parts are outside there on the booth. You are here, the experts, to making nice exhibits or nice functional parts. We are here to understand the materials that are needed for the processes. Um, we will go through some of the topics um, in, uh, in a nutshell. Uh, overall, those that know DuPont, yes, we are a materials supplier in the world of engineering polymers. And uh, so basically, we are highly uh, expertised in semi-crystalline resins from uh, polyamide, uh, semi-aromatic polyamides, uh, polyesters, uh, polyacetals, and so on. I think this is well known. And this is a little bit the reason why we are coming on the market so late. You could imagine the hype of uh, FFF free, uh, uh, of, um, or FDM, FFF technology is a little bit over. But we realize with the many industry contacts that we have that the technology is not yet fully exploited. If the re right materials were available, we could do much more functional components with this technology. So that's the premiere. We are introducing a couple of products. One is a polyamide. This is a long chain polyamide with extremely easy processing. And I would hope that you experience that one day. Um, overall, we have uh, very good uh, mechanical properties. And uh, what is also new today and what we want to announce the first time here in this region is that these uh, products will be available through German RepRap as of probably next week. Or this week, I think the internet page is not yet up. Uh, you can always order via info uh, on their via email, but I think in the next days before the Fakuma trade show in Friedrichshafen, the whole thing should be up. So nylon is a nice product. It's chemical resistance. I think it's well known in the industry. And when you look into the automotive world and you open uh, the bonnet of the car, most components are made of nylon, at least those that are exposed to heat, oil, and uh, all the solvents in the automotive industry. Another product that we are introducing is Hytrel, that's a thermoplastic uh, elastomer, well known in the market as well in many automotive components from CDG boots to airbag uh, deployment doors and many, many other uh, parts have been made over the last 20, 30 years in Hytrel. And here we have something exceptional uh, and we will show data later on when I finish here the sales pitch. Uh, that we have extremely good uh, Z or Z direction strength properties. It will be available in shorty, hardness 40 and 60, and again it can be ordered via German RepRap. Another product that is to come onto the market, it's not yet uh, ready to be uh, commercially launched. This is a Ionomer, so it's basically one of the first polyethylene grades. Uh, Serlin is a polyethylene ionomer, so it has a very fine crystalline structure and stays highly transparent. Uh, I should have shown a few parts over there. But 
So these are the products that we are just about to introduce um, in these days. And uh, here you see the overview of the, um, of the properties in terms of uh, density, melting points is obvious, but I think you're probably interested in, sorry, in the modulus 1.6 for the nylon and a uh, very good strain at break for the hydro grades. I think this is uh, what some people will be looking for. Yes, all those grades are unreinforced at this point of time. When we look into the industry of additive manufacturing, particularly around uh, fused filament fabrication, there has been a lot of effort and a lot of demonstrations about making a nice shape, holding it in your hand, so basically meeting the needs of a form for designers. So shape, proportion, size, handling, haptics, all that is definitely very important. When we look into the automotive industry and the needs of uh, making components uh, in that area, it goes a little bit beyond that. We have to look into the strength, temperature, chemical environment, friction and wear properties, regulatory requirements, safety, and so on. And you may probably know more requirements that are even not listed here. Uh, so this is, for instance, an engine bracket from Daimler that it's not 3D printed. It is still injection molded. <laughs> but that holds the full weight of the engine over the lifetime of the car uh, with, a, with a very long static um, load. So, I mean, this is the type of application development that we are permanently involved in. So we, we know the language of the automotive industry and what they need. And basically what is needed here, we are, the industry is moving from from making gadgets to making really functional parts. The difficulty is that each part that has to be made needs to be fully qualified. So is it going to, to withstand all the loads and environment and so on? So uh, for a series of one part, you probably have a lot of development activity. The manufacturing is the shortest time. And uh, when we look into some of those applications, uh, we had talks on the other side of the hall uh, the first oil pan that we developed for Daimler in uh, short fiber reinforced polyamide took three, four years to develop. So, I mean, you understand that automotive components, it's not enough to just make the right shape and the right tolerances and the right modulus. So it needs material characterization, so you have to know how it performs. So a lot of tensile testing, stress strain curves, and so on. Then it needs the pre predictive uh, engineering. So today you cannot knock the doors of any automotive OEM telling him that you have the best material but you have no idea on how to simulate it on a computer in a model because no one is going to cut a prototype tool or whatsoever. They, they really want to, to simulate everything up front before they, they engage into a technology product or material. Then obviously the process capabilities and robustness, and I heard uh, a couple of good news here on the show on uh, fused uh, filament fabrication about uh, new things that are coming up that help us making a very robust and reliable process. And then obviously the testing and quality control, which is not only dimensional, but also what about the morphology, what about the, uh, the porosity of the parts and so on. And I will show you there uh, a computer tomography of a specific component later. So it needs a little bit of science and engineering beyond making just a, a nice shape. And we have been basically looking into two particular topics for semi-crystalline uh, polymers. And this is the reason why those grades are not so obvious and are not seen at every corner on the market compared to PLA, ABS and, and some other products. So those nylons and PBTs and polyacetals and all those semi-crystalline products take a while in order to be fit for the process. And one of the things that had to be tackled is the warping. You cannot see it well on the picture here, but those parts have the tendency to warp a little bit. So that had to be fixed and that is, has been done with uh, the new material developments. There is some theoretical background on that and those who are familiar with injection molding, they probably understand that with a PVT diagram of a product, which is basically the uh, specific volume, temperature, and with isobar curves on it. So basically you can tell my polymer at 100 degrees and um, at uh, one bar has 0.85 uh, cubic centimeter per gram. Yeah, that, that's what this diagram tells. You can go through the whole process, uh, 
the nice thing about uh, fused filament fabrication is that you stay here on the one bar line. Yeah? So basically you go up to the temperature of transformation or processing. This is a PLA, an amorphous grade, and then you cool it down again and you end up again in the same thing. Uh, what we need to look at, as soon as it is solidifies, which is exactly this point at the glass transition temperature, uh, the, the further cool down until ambient temperature, this is the delta volume, this is the volumetric shrinkage that happens with the polymer. For a PLA, uh, the classical and highly appreciated polymer on the market, this one is, is very small. If you look into a polyamide 6, for instance, the delta V is extremely large because there's a full crystallization happening, the morphologic reorientation of the polymer, and that means uh, a lot of shrinkage happens. In injection molding, this is compensated with hold pressure. In additive manufacturing, it cannot be compensated. So these were the things that uh, we had to deal with when developing semi-crystalline polymers. The other thing is, I hope you have not seen that uh, too often in your uh, labs, yeah? is a, a lack of adhesion. So when you put the next layer on a solidified layer, it must adhere well. That makes your z-axis properties. And uh, here again, there is a, a theoretical background that, that contributes to the adhesion uh, question. And here you see the uh, a diagram, which is called a differential scanning calorimeter. It's basically, it tells you how much energy goes into the polymer and how much energy is being um, absorbed by the, polygy, by the polymer when you change the morphology. For instance, melting the crystals or crystallizing or stuff like that. So basically what happens here, you um, heat the first time a PLA, then you freeze it and it's fully amorphous, there's no peak at all. And when you heat it a second time, there's a very little heat here. So basically what happens when you apply PLA on PLA, which means the next layer in your slicing model, you, you only need one joule per gram in order to remelt the surface. So it's not much. When you take a polyamide 66, you will realize when you melt, uh, it melts here at 261 here on this chart, uh, you have a huge peak. And when it freezes, it releases the energy at a much lower temperature, only 220. So the difficulty is a frozen surface skin of polyamide 66 can only be remelted when you get this energy in and thus on top of that at the right temperature level. But the next layer absorbs it at a lower temperature level. So there's a couple of dilemmas. And that is not very helpful. However, these are the things that the industries and the many players and, and also chemical companies that make polyamide have to think about in order to improve all these uh, capabilities of the polymers. So this is the theoretical background. So that, that were the things that we had to solve. It took some time. And uh, one evidence that we can show here is one uh, nice chair that we printed. It's a double cantilever chair, which was designed at the um, Royal College of Art by the designer Frederick Rech. We printed it on a large scale um, X1000 printer from German RepRap. I have to admit, the, uh, this is a nylon, and the surface here is in hydro, which is the elastomeric material. Um, the, the basis was segmented. We could not do that in the time, uh, in, in one, and it was never designed for 3D printing. This was more, let's say, a, a design study. But we succeeded to make the parts at the end and um, to assemble that together, and we did not face major shrinkage or adhesion uh, difficulties. And at the end, we had a very nice chair that has been shown on uh, exhibitions. So if you come to Fakuma, maybe in Friedrichshafen, you, you might see the chair on our booth. So let's talk about the characterization of the polymers, which are 3D printed. Um, so the, uh, the high troll, which that's the short E60, the interesting aspect of it, um, when we print vertical or flat, uh, we, we have good properties and they are even in the same order of magnitude in terms of modulus or straight up break as an injection molded part. So finally, there's a product that is not far away from injection molding in terms of isotropy. So people, who are familiar with those products and that have experience in injection molding can now think about additive manufacturing for these grades. And what is particularly nice is the z-direction properties, which is in the same order of magnitude and xy. And uh, here, this is uh, testing by the SKZ uh, Institute in Würzburg, um, where basically all the tensile bars that had been 
printed in X, Y, and Z direction show very good consistency. So here we, we start relying that additive manufacturing with FFF gives consistent product quality so people can count on um, the performance of a part um, as it's being uh, printed or manufactured. Um, the same for the soft grades, again, the um, stress strain curves from the tensile machine as those parts were printed. This is Z direction, this is XY, very similar, and uh, the, uh, the, the uh, stress at the break was around 100%, so there's enough elasticity for all functionality. Typically, I mean, in this area we have the elastic phase, and here we have permanent deformation. Uh, so people would, I mean, typically we stop all testing for elastomeric materials at 50% strain. Uh, but I mean here just for the purpose of showing that it goes beyond that. Dimensional stability, that has been one of the key things that many users have been addressing. Uh, I mean, for those elastomeric resins, we realized that we don't have a big issue with deformation. So they printed here at the Institute uh, these U profiles, which are sensitive to warpage. And uh, I mean the deformation of uh, those grades, whether it's the, the soft one or the shorty 60, is, is nice. It's really something you can work with uh, for real components. When we look into the polyamide grade that we are launching, so the flat bars XY direction, uh, we are not so far in terms of, um, I mean, a stress adhered from the injection molding. Um, and also the conditioned parts, so once they have absorbed the moisture, and all polyamides are a little bit sensitive in that respect, is very close to the dry as printed or dry as molded components. So that also gives the confidence that uh, we, parts can be made where the, the behavior is predictable once they pick up moisture. <clears throat> so the same nylon is much more sensitive in terms of uh, deformation and warpage. And here their study has been carried out at SKZ that have um, a, a built machine for academia that has a heated chamber up to, I think, on even 180 centigrades or so. Uh, but so we, they printed again those U-shapes and indeed we have the evidence that the heated chamber contributes to make flat parts or warpage-free parts. So we believe that these parameters start to become important. So uh, our best guess is that uh, for the nylon grades, you, you need a, a machine construction that at least has a natural heating of the chamber that goes up to 50 or 80 centigrades. That would be very helpful. Um, here you see the computer tomography of an automotive component. Um, this is a suspension component, which is a safety device. It is either made in polyurethane or it's made in hydro. Um, I'll get to the part a little bit later furthermore. So it's highly compressed. Um, and you see here all those little blue dots here on the part. These are internal um, porosities. If someone in automotive would look at a part and is used to see extruded or injection molded components, he would say he needs to reject the part, it's no good because there's porosities in there. And indeed, I mean, in injection molding, you can avoid that. But in additive manufacturing with um, filament um, fabrication, uh, this is not so easy because you have an entirely pressureless um, process here. Um, we are not spending any time in solving the porosity problem because it's not a problem. Um, the materials are so good in terms of uh, resistance against crack propagation that the porosity is not a big, big deal. We need to characterize them such on the really 3D printed conditions so that all this aspect of the internal values can be considered in the, in the model. So this is uh, the John's bumper, um, which can exist in various shapes uh, in order to have very specific compression curves in automotive. And uh, we are showing here such a component that is compressed with uh, 10 kilonewtons or one ton, so it goes on block. And uh, you see here the part, uh, which is hollow, so it has been 3D printed. Um, um, it's basic, typically it's been made with a sort of blow molding process. Yeah? So that's also where all those wall thicknesses come from. Interesting enough, 
as the part is completely compressed with 10 kilonewton, you create a lot of shear stress. And this part by no means had any crack propagation at all. So, I mean, here all the properties are good enough in order to make such components for automotive. Maybe they will not last 200,000 kilometers in the suspension, but they will be good enough for first road test of 1,000 kilometers, 5,000, maybe 10,000. That's what we don't know. What we did on top was dynamic testing. So we tested those 3D printed components with 10,000 cycles, and we stopped the test for, for timing reasons, because those tests can, can take months if you continue them. And we had no internal failure, nothing um, could be observed on the part. And let's say the compression curve is very typical for those components made in um, the Osberger press blower process, uh, which is sort of a blow molding. So it, it gives indeed uh, the hope that uh, those people could one day maybe um, go more into additive manufacturing versus cutting aluminum tools, put them on their blow molding machine and then test all the shapes and geometries that suit the exact uh, needs of, of an OEM. Um, so collaboration, so we move a little bit in the things that can be done in the future. Um, as I said, we, we, we do not have thousand parts to show here at this point of time. I have a box there for those that want to see the nice surface aspect and so we can show. But we have a couple of ideas that uh, arise with, uh, through discussions with customers. So this is uh, constant velocity uh, boots. I mean, these are the uh, CVG boots which are on the axle. These parts are blow molded in hydro since 25 years. We even got an award from the Society of Plastics Engineers because there's more than one billion boots in cars that are working fine in a thermoplastic product. And you can imagine that, uh, I mean, this has been 3D printed. Uh, this is a design of Trelleborg. And uh, you can imagine that for the first evaluation, for the, the first road test, you could use those 3D printed uh, boots instead of um, a blow molded component where you need to, to make an aluminum mold at least. Huh? So this is one of the, the ideas. Uh, another thing which is always tricky uh, when we look in blow molding processes, um, that you don't have an ideal wall thickness control. Since you're blowing apart, uh, you have thin walls where you stretch the material more, where you blow more than in the, in the uh, small diameter sections. Often you want the wall thickness at a different locations. So with 3D printing, let's say the wall thickness distribution can be much better optimized for the performance of a component. So the designer needs a total rethinking process in order to accommodate these uh, behaviors. Another area is um, air, uh, blow molded um, um, air ducts. So between the uh, charge air cooler and the engine inlet, uh, you have temperatures which are below 140 degrees or centigrades. So basically, most of those components in most of the cars and turbocharged engines are blow molded hydro components. So it's a thermoplastic. Huh? I mean, after the uh, turbocharger, the air is too hot. Huh? So that leaves rubber type of uh, materials, often with reinforcements. But after the charge air cooler, it is entirely um, common use to have a hydro in a blow molded component. However, there needs to be a, a lot of welding, uh, trimming, and then the, you need attachment points that need to be welded as well. Uh, the things get more complicated. And you can imagine one day, uh, this part has been 3D printed. Uh, you can even make, uh, let's say, um, um, uh, a connection or let's say two inlets and one outlet, things like these. You can integrate attachment points and the diameter variations. Because again, in every pressure hose or pressure component, the thicker your, wall thick uh, your, the thicker your diameter is, the more wall thickness you would need in order to accommodate the stress. Blow molding doesn't like that. Blow molding, when we have a big diameter, the wall often gets very thin. So here, again, it, it gives new options for design and optimization. So this is um, rather interesting, I would say. Another area we are looking into is, uh, that's particularly driven by polyacetals, is a technology that is also shown on the other hole and the Arbok booth. It's the free former technology where you start with granules and uh, basically you add mi micro droplets uh, to the components and um, here again with semi-crystalline polymers there is uh, to our knowledge there's no single semi-crystalline polymers today qualified for that machine 
for the same reason, which is deformation and, um, and adhesion. So again here, there's a little bit of work to be done, but uh, we succeeded uh, with some acetal grades to make first parts, but that will still take a little bit of time. But I mean, uh, most of the uh, component manufacturers that make gears or clips and so, they would like to see one day a good solution in, uh, in polyacetal, which is their construction material per se. Another area that uh, we are looking into, uh, which we, we find interesting, is the direct um, six-axis extrusion laying process. Um, here you see the video from the last K show with our high chill. So you have a, a mini extruder connected to a six-axis robot and you put layer by layer with, as with any other additive uh, manufacturing process. The reason why this is interesting, I mean the first parts do not have the same resolution. They do not look as nice as FDM parts. However, um, if you look into this component, which is similar to that one, height of uh, 15 centimeters, this one on uh, FDM takes uh, four, three, four, let's say four hours, yeah? and that one takes 20 minutes. So you see factor 10 productivity improvement. So that gives, again, hope. And the other interesting aspect is the users would like to use the same material as they use in the blow molding process because then they are confident that all their qualification, what they've been doing for the material, uh, does not need to be repeated with a new material that is being introduced. So basically, granule-based technologies for additive manufacturing. So this is a little bit all the, the things that we're looking at. I'm not telling that this is ready to go. You cannot buy turnkey uh, solutions today, but maybe in, I don't know, three, four, five years, uh, this one will progress. And as with every industry that you see here, where at the beginning people have been smiling and say that 3D printing is for toys, and today it's a serious uh, new technology, disruptive technology that has evolved to a very, let's say, te technical and, and mature uh, industry already. I mean, this hall here, I mean, okay, it's not as big as the other one, but I mean, maybe in two, three years, this hall will will be as big as the one next to here, which is the standard polymer processing. So we believe that in the um, world of additive manufacturing, there's still a lot of surprises will come up with creative people out there. We are not going to invent uh, all the processes. I think there's enough people that can handle that. But I think our role here is to, to make the right materials for those processes. And not materials that are just looking nice, but they need to perform in the harsh environments of their use. So in order to recap, so we have introduced now in EMEA the uh, cytal and hydro grades of polyamide and thermoplastic elastomer, now available. FFF is fit for functional parts. I mean, if someone is telling it's just for toys, I would go into an argument here because I believe you can make very strong and reliable components with this. And here again the discussion with automotive OEMs. I know that they love and they like SLS because uh, it has very good Z-axis properties and, and has a good surface finish. But I think with new materials coming up, I think they, some of them will have to reconsider if the uh, filament-based technology cannot play a certain role in certain areas. So, um, yeah, I mean, the industrial users, they, they, they are waiting for semi-crystalline polymers to come onto the market. And we're happy that there's also other players that brought such materials on the market, so that's good for the industry. Um, so I believe that machine technology will evolve, so there will be improvements. And one improvement that I saw here on the show, and I'm not allowed here to cite any names, but uh, there, there's one company that uh, has been launching a, a dryer for the spools. I think that's fantastic, why, because most of the engineering products in filament form they, they are a little bit moisture sensitive. So there's one company that have made a little box, the spool can in there, and so uh, with a desiccant technology, the spool stays dry and can be used or can be stopped, and that will contribute to the reliability of manufacturing in, in uh, FFF technology. Um, so production speed, I mean, that's, that's the overall theme. Huh? I mean, today, if you have to make a production of 100 parts, you would probably say, 
Oh, okay, feasible, if I have the right time, probably, okay. Thousand parts, people will step out and probably they will say, okay, SLS, I have a big box, I can make 200 parts in one go. Interesting. Uh, 100,000 parts, I would assume that everyone declines to make such a campaign with additive manufacturing. But I think we, we will be surprised in the future how this is going to evolve uh, as the production speed goes, goes faster. So reinforcement technologies, yes, this is also on our radar screen. Uh, there's uh, work to be done. The difficulty with the reinforcement is, yes, you can improve the modulus. But as you are putting layer by layer, the z-axis does not benefit from the reinforcement because it's a pure weld line between the polymers. So you cannot go beyond the, the polymer itself, the strengths there. So that's a little bit, and maybe something needs to be found there. Overhangs, I mean, these are the things you know very well. Quality control, mechanical and dynamic characterization, and this is the expensive piece here. I mean, doing dynamic evaluation of components is a very cost and time intensive um, occupation here. So we need new design rules. I mean, we, we preached to the plastic industry since 10, 20, 30 years, please make equivalent wall thickness. That's beneficial for cycle time, productivity, performance for everything, for surface aspect. And now suddenly with additive manufacturing, we can tell the people, no, you can put material where you need it. So you can work on topographic optimization as you want. It gives much more freedom. But someone needs to, and I've seen a couple of very nice examples out here in the halls. Huh? Predictive engineering, we talked about that. And um, granule-based technology is something that Users will always ask for, also for, for the pricing question. Yeah, I mean, if uh, you buy polymer on the market, it's probably, uh, even if it's a good technical polymer, it might be between five and 10 euro per kilogram, and you know the prices of filament and, and powders on the market, so people would like to use uh, granules if possible. Huh? Yeah, so that was a little bit, uh, in a snapshot, the things that um, DuPont looks into. We hope that in the future we can come with, with more materials that help uh, new processes. But if you have a new process or new idea, don't hesitate to come uh, and see me. Uh, I have a box with a couple of components to show. If people want to have the evidence of the surface aspect, uh, then I have something for you. Okay. With that, many thanks for your attention. And wish you a good show here at